So let's look at index structures. So what is an index structure? Typically, if database people talk about index structures, or for short indexes, we mean some sort of data structure like a hash map or some tree structured index. But there are many other index structures that are used and that are important in database systems. So let's look at that. Well, actually, most of those index structures are digital versions of physical structures. So you know already from real life physical indexes. And the, the most prominent example is probably the catalog in a library. Back in the old days in libraries, you didn't have computers to search for books. You had these cards. So those cards were organized in the catalog and for each book you had a separate card. And when you were looking for something like the history of whatever starts with T, history of time, for example, you then would look up the cards in that specific drawer and hopefully find the right book. That was an early version of an index. Other examples for indexes are all kinds of street signs. So assume you're in the Alps and you're looking for a specific bus stop. Let's say this one. So you have two options to search that bus stop. Option one is ignore all signs. Ignore signs. Which means whatever sign you find, you ignore it. You just walk all the tracks, all the different paths you find in the Alps. Eventually, with a lot of luck and after a lot of time, you will hit that bus stop. You will find that bus stop. That will take a while, of course. The second option is you follow the signs. Yeah? Which means you find the sign, you trust that sign. And this sign basically allows you to reduce the search space. So rather than walking all the Alps, you can reduce the search space because you know that everything that is on the right doesn't have to be considered. The bus stop you're looking for must be on the left. So you follow the sign and by that you find that bus stop way earlier. So that's the same idea as in indexing, reducing the search space by following signs, by following pointers, following routes, given by the index. So this holds for all kinds of street signs, of course. Rather than following roads randomly, you follow the street signs. By that, you reduce the search space. And that also holds for maps. So assume you're in a building. Let's assume you're here and you want to follow a specific keynote. The keynote happens here. So rather than searching all the building, rather than running through all the rooms randomly, you can directly go there and enter that room where the keynote is going to happen. So a very prominent example for indexes is the phone book, of course. So before phone books were put into computers, there were only the printed versions and every household that had a phone connection received such a phone book every year. In the phone book, all the entries are ordered by name. So if you look for a specific entry, let's say the family eye care center, then you can very effectively search the phone book. Basically, you do a binary search, a manual binary search. And then once you find that entry, you see here the road and you see the phone number. That is nothing but an index. So a very important concept we will have to understand when talking about indexes is the term selectivity. Unfortunately, the definition of selectivity is misleading. So let's look at the definition. How is it defined? So let's assume you select something from a relation. Let's assume you have a condition like um, A equals 42. This is your input relation R. And then we count the number of qualifying tuples. Yeah? Those are the tuples that qualify under that selection. And we can contrast that with the number of tuples in the relation. So obviously this must be smaller equal one, right? So if everything qualifies as everything is selected, basically if you had a condition here to true, nothing would be filtered out, then all the tuples from R would qualify. Then this would be the same number as that number, then this would be one. In any other situation, it must be strictly smaller than one, and of course, greater or equal zero. If this is false, that's the other extreme, then this must be zero, zero divided by whatever number is zero, of course. So this is the selectivity. Selectivity is defined exactly like that. And 
in order to understand indexes, especially in order to make a decision whether it makes sense to use an index, it's very important to understand those selectivities. To understand, given a specific selection criteria, what is the number of tuples that quali qualify with respect to the total number of tuples in the relation? Let's explain that more visually. So what is a low selectivity? Assume that everything that's blue here is relation R and assume that everything that's green here qualifies under a condition. Let's again say A equals 42. So green, the green boxes here symbolize the tuples where A equals 42. Everything that's blue is tuples where that condition does not hold. A is not equal 42. And then visually here you see the relationship. There are quite a number of tuples where A equals 42. And this is called a low selectivity. Low selectivity because the filter condition doesn't filter out too many tuples. Only a few tuples are filtered out, maybe two-thirds in this example. In contrast, this is a high selectivity. High selectivity means many, many tuples are filtered out. Only five tuples survive that selection operation. Only for five tuples, A equals 42. And this is called a high selectivity. Well, and this is counterintuitive, right? Because if you assume we had the high selectivity, let's write it down again. So, high selectivity. In the example, it was something like five tuples divided by the number of tuples in R. Let's assume R has whatever, 10,000 tuples. So 10,000 tuples. So the selectivity we're talking about is something like 5 divided by 10,000. That's a very small number actually. Yeah, this is 0 0.0000. So this is 0 0.0005 as a number. In contrast, low selectivity, low selectivity. Now let's go back to that example we had here. Here many, many tuples qualify. I don't know how many tuples this actually is, but let's assume it's whatever. Let's say 1,000. So we have low selectivity. 1,000 tuples qualify divided by 10,000 again, which is 0.1. Yeah, and this is counterintuitive because here high selectivity doesn't imply it's a big number. This says it's a small number. The smaller this number, the higher the selectivity. It's exactly the opposite as expected. In other words, the bigger the number, the lower the selectivity. Yeah? Low selectivity means this ratio is very close to 1. High selectivity means this ratio is very close to 0. That's exactly what, what these numbers show. So low selectivity, many tuples qualify. You can think about medium selectivities. That is something in between. The boundaries between high and medium selectivity or between medium and low selectivity are fuzzy somewhat. But at least in high selectivity, it is the case that only very few tuples qualify. So this is important to understand for the following discussion. And one other thing you should be aware of, sometimes you hear about this argument, so why would you need indexes anyway? If it's in, for instance, if it's in main memory, what the heck? Whatever you do, you can search your tuples in a few milliseconds, but this is totally wrong. So it doesn't matter whether you're on hard disk or whether you're in main memory, random access is expensive. So you might be surprised to, to learn that random access is something you should worry about in main memory, but there are two types of random accesses. So when you hear about random access, you might think, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, that's the I.O. Disk seeks, disk seeks, we learned about, and that's expensive. But again, you have the similar effect in main memory. There are certain latencies, there are access times in the order of 80 nanoseconds, or 60 nanoseconds, depends on the concrete device, but it costs something to randomly access data, even though it's in main memory. If you're unsure about that, look back at my video on the storage hierarchy. So there is random access, and that is expensive. 
and um, you have to contrast that with the costs for a full scan. So also in my memory, you have the same trade-offs as on a hard disk. It's just that the constants differ a lot. So you have this effect that sequential access is relatively cheap, be it hard disks or main memory. And then you might think, okay, no need to selectively access the data because this is so super fast. And then you might conclude no need for data structures at all. You might conclude the same thing for hard disk or for main memory. So for any query, whatever you do, you just scan the data. And in fact, there are some data managing systems out there that do exactly that, especially for main memory systems. When the hype on my memory system started like in 2000 something, so in the first decade of 2000, some systems really ignored indexes. They said, okay, what the heck, it's in my memory, we can just scan it. And that's, let's call it plain wrong. If you want to be more careful, let's call it dangerous. At least dangerous. Why? Well, if you look back at this example with a high selectivity, only few tuples are selected, only few tuples qualify, then you can simply do the mass. Let's assume that you have to do a random lookup for each of the tuples on disk. But how much does it take roughly to do a random lookup? Let's say it's 10 milliseconds on a very slow hard disk. 10 milliseconds each. 10 milliseconds to look up each of those. So basically we have 5 times 10 milliseconds, which is 0.05 seconds to look it up randomly. So let's assume on the other hand that all the blue stuff is one terabyte of data. So one terabyte of data given a bandwidth of 100 megabytes per second takes 10,000 seconds to scan. So for one terabyte, let's assume one terabyte and let's assume a bandwidth of 100 megabytes per second. You simply divide this by that. So you need 10 seconds to scan a gigabyte and then you need 10,000 seconds to scan a terabyte. That would be the difference of scanning the data versus accessing the data with an index. And then you see the selectivity kicks in because here you it makes a huge difference how many tuples actually qualify, how many tuples need to be fetched randomly from disk. And then Eventually, it might happen that the costs for randomly looking up the data become bigger than the scan. This is an important thing you need to understand in databases because we often have to make a decision whether to use the index or whether to scan the data. But you see here already, it's a huge difference and you will feel that whether you spend three hours to scan your data or just 50 milliseconds. Yeah, and then if you really say, okay, what the heck, but I have all my data in my memory, that is the argument I already mentioned. So why would I use an index? Scanning data in my memory is so fast. Who cares about indexes? Well, actually that's true, but scanning is very, very fast. However, if you use similar assumptions as before, so let's assume we have one terabyte of data, but now it's not 100 megabytes per second disk bandwidth. Let's assume we have 10 gigabytes per second bandwidth sustained on the memory bus. So you divide that, one terabyte divided by 10, and you get 100 seconds to scan the data. So, but then if you do the math, how long would it take to access the data in main memory randomly using some sort of index structure? And then you end up with something like that. Huh? So this is actually 500 nanoseconds, 500 nanoseconds. Here I assumed 100 nanoseconds for each lookup times five, you end up with 0 0.5 microseconds. So this is a huge difference. Yes? So it's the same trade-off on disk, randomly seeking to a position on disk versus scanning the entire disk as it is in main memory. Scanning all of the data in main memory takes a while versus randomly accessing the data. So you have the same trade-offs. It's just that we have different constants, be it for the memory bandwidth versus randomly accessing data in DRAM or be it for the disk bandwidth, scanning data from disk versus accessing blocks randomly on disk. And that's an important trade-off yeah, you really have to keep in mind when, when talking about index structures. 
Yeah, so basically these indexes, as we will learn in the following videos, work like street signs. Very often you have recursive street signs. Sometimes you have street signs that are very, very big and directly point you to a specific tuple, but there are other cases where you have to follow multiple street signs to reach your goal. So if you go back to those five tuples, so usually what's, what these indexes do, they allow you to cut the search space exponentially. So on the, the first street sign tells you, okay, you don't have to go right. And by that you can ignore all of this. All of this, this can be ignored. So 50% of the search space can be ignored directly. You know, you gotta go left in order to find your goal. And then recursively, of course, yeah, this can all be ignored. We know already there might be another street sign. So again, we're interested in this bus stop here. Here the street sign points down so we can ignore this one again. We are able to reduce more and more of the data of that original search space and make the search space smaller and smaller and smaller every step. So that's the same effect as in street signs. We will see that in indexes. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there!